Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you. If you have a Bible with you, I want to invite you to turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 is where we're going to be. And while you're turning there, I want to just add my voice to what uh, Pastor Michael said a moment ago about missions. I do hope that you will begin to pray now about how God will uh, use you to be part of what we're doing for missions. Uh, Our Church-wide focus um, last year was on homes, the home front initiative. Our church-wide focus this year has been on neighborhoods and reaching our neighbors with, with the gospel. But next year, our church-wide focus is going to be on loving the nations and participating in God's mission around the world. Jesus said in Matthew 28, make disciples of all nations. And so Jesus invites us to be part of his mission And our prayer is that we will pray and give and go and send like never before. And I hope that you'll begin praying now about how God wants you to be a part of that. Just behind me in the choir loft, there's 50 or 60 people going through our uh, new members class. And I had a chance to speak to them a few moments ago. And uh, what I wanted to tell them is uh, it's a membership requirement that you have a passport or get a passport. I want missions to be so ingrained in our culture as a church that it's just expected that you're going to get a passport and that you're going to be part of going. And uh, listen, if you're unable to go, you can pray for those who are going. If you're unable to go, you can give to help those uh, who are able to go. But I hope that you'll, you'll participate. And I'm excited to see not only what the Lord is going to do there as we take mission trips all around the world, but also what he's going to do here. Uh, in and amongst our own church. There's nothing that is as life-changing as taking a mission trip. It will change your life here. And so I hope that you'll participate in that. We're also going to be taking a uh, world missions offering. And you'll hear more about this over the next uh, few weeks as we get closer to the end of the year. But as a church, we're going to be raising $500,000 for missions next year above and beyond what we budget for missions, which is already hundreds of thousands of dollars to give away to missionaries. But we're gonna raise an additional half a million dollars in the next year from December to December. We'll be giving it to the International Mission Board, the North American Mission Board to send relief and then also to local uh, mission projects as well. And so I'm really excited just to see what the Lord is gonna do. It's appropriate to talk about that this morning as we turn to Titus chapter two, because as we continue in our series in the book of Titus about what makes for a healthy church, This morning, we come to Titus chapter two, which is about the importance of having a healthy mission as a church. A number of years ago, when I was in seminary in Kentucky, uh, I went to a museum in Louisville uh, that was dedicated to military history. And I'm fascinated by that. And so really enjoyed just walking through the halls and the floors of that uh, museum. One of the things that I was struck with, it kind of a repeated theme that I saw were the stories of soldiers who uh, would have a premonition about their death in battle. They would get some weird feeling that they were gonna die in a battle. And so a lot of them would write letters um, to their families before going into battle. And some of those letters were in the museum. You could read kind of their their last words uh, before going into battle. And as you can imagine, those letters became precious to their families. One of the letters really stuck out to me. Stuck out to me. It was a letter written during the Civil War, written by a guy named Sullivan Ballou to his wife. He had a premonition that he was going to go into battle and die. He did. But before he went into battle, he wrote a last love letter to his wife. And in that letter, part of what he said is is the following. He said, death is creeping behind me with his fatal dart. If I do not return alive, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I love you. And when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Wow. Guys, take note. That's how to write a love letter. That is pretty good. When my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Can you imagine the tremendous responsibility that would have been entrusted to the courier of that last love letter? I mean, the last words from Sullivan Ballou to his wife, written down, handed to a courier, tremendous amount of responsibility entrusted to make sure that that love letter got to Sullivan Ballou's wife. And as we think about that, I want us to to, to think about, as we look at Titus chapter two, the tremendous responsibility and importance that has been entrusted to the church of Jesus because we have been entrusted with a message more valuable, more important, more precious than any last love letter written to to a wife by human lips. We have been entrusted with a gospel message and it is our job to get that message to its intended recipients, amen? 
God has a love letter for the world. We call that the good news of Jesus. And he has entrusted that message to the church and healthy churches take seriously the responsibility to get that message that's been entrusted to us to the world. That is the mission of the church. And really that is a theme throughout the book of Titus. If you remember back in Titus chapter one and verse three, Paul says, I have been entrusted with a message that God has commanded me to proclaim. Titus chapter two and verse one begins with the word proclaim. That is the mission of the church, to proclaim the message of the gospel that has been entrusted to the church by Jesus to the world. And healthy churches embrace that. In fact, that is the big idea of the text this morning is that healthy churches embrace the mission of entrusting to others the gospel that has been entrusted to us. A healthy church will embrace the mission of entrusting the gospel that has been entrusted to us to entrust that to others. And that is what Titus chapter two, verses one through eight is all about. That is really the thrust of this paragraph is the mission of the church. Sometimes as you'll see, as we read this passage, sometimes um, the focus of this paragraph, we kind of get lost in a little bit of the details because Paul's gonna talk about men and women and men's roles and women's roles. And sometimes we get so kind of caught up in the weeds of that, that we miss the bigger point that Paul is making. The passage begins with the word proclaim. That is the mission of the church. And that is what this paragraph is about. So let's look together at Titus chapter two, and I'm gonna read verses one through eight. And then I'm gonna unpack this for us as we think about how to have a healthy mission as a church. Titus chapter two and verse one, it says, but you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity. There should be a period right there. In your teaching, your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Okay, I believe that this passage <clears throat> is primarily about the mission that Jesus has given to his church to proclaim the gospel to the next generation. I think that Paul is actually giving us three ways to carry out that mission. Paul's gonna tell us that the mission should be guided by doctrine, that the mission should be grounded in discipleship and that the mission's goal, the goal of the mission should be devotion. So I wanna just unpack those ideas as we walk through the text together this morning. The first is simply this, that Paul is telling Titus to make sure that the mission, the mission of proclaiming that which has been entrusted, make sure that mission is guarded and guided by doctrine. Notice in verse one and verse eight, Paul bookends this paragraph with references to sound teaching or sound doctrine. In verse one, he says, you are to proclaim things that are consistent with sound teaching. In other words, in your proclamation mission, as you are proclaiming what has been entrusted to you, make sure that you're doing it in a manner that is consistent with sound teaching. And then in verse eight, he says, in your teaching, your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that our opponents will be ashamed having nothing bad to say about us. Paul is stressing here the importance that as we carry out the mission that Jesus has given us to us, has given to us, that we pay attention to the importance of sound teaching. Now, this was especially important for the churches on Crete because they have been infiltrated and invaded by false teachers. You remember Paul addresses false teachers in Titus chapter one, false teachers who had a, a, a false message. They're, they were theologically inaccurate and they had spread a false message of the gospel in a way that was harmful and destructive for the churches. And Paul has condemned that in chapter one. He says, don't pay attention to false teaching. And then in chapter two, he says, when you're proclaiming the message, make sure you pay attention to sound teaching. Sound teaching matters, amen? For Paul, the gospel was a matter of first importance. And Paul 
believed and we should believe that, that getting the message right, that as we carry out the mission, that getting the message right has to be of utmost importance to us. For, for something to be considered sound, when he says, pay attention to sound teaching, the word sound means to be healthy or fit or reliable or sturdy. If, if the frame of a house is not sound, the house might collapse. If a body is not sound, then it's susceptible to disease and being unhealthy. If the wood of a guitar is not sound, then the tone won't be true. Sound teaching is teaching that's solid, healthy, sturdy, and reliable. And the integrity of the message was of utmost importance for the Apostle Paul. He says, in your message, uh, in your teaching, have integrity and dignity. Yes, Lord, we're listening. <laughs> it's like a knock from heaven. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as he was talking about the gospel. He says, I wanted to make clear to you the gospel that I was preaching to you. Sound teaching matters. Being clear on what the gospel actually is is really important when we're carrying out the mission. Think about it. As we go all around the world next year, 18 plus mission trips, we've got to make sure that of first importance, that step number one in going on a mission trip is that we understand the message clearly that we're trying to get to people. We don't want to just come and bring some false teaching or inaccurate uh, explanation of the gospel. We want to make sure that step number one as we're carrying out the mission is that we get the message right. That we, that we make sure that we're solid on what we're passing on. Amen? That we have sound teaching. Now, I think that's an important word for the American church because if you look at the spectrum of churches all across our country, you have some churches that are so focused on mission, they focus on mission to the exclusion of doctrine. Some ministries are so focused on reaching tons of people, their highest priority is making sure the message gets to as many people as possible. Their highest priority is reaching people. But if you look under the hood and you look at their theology or you look at their teaching, it's a little sketchy. They'll sometimes say it this way. You know, uh, we're just all about Jesus. We just don't really focus too much on doctrine. That's a warning sign. That should be a red flag for you. What will happen is if you focus on mission to the exclusion of doctrine, if your highest priority is getting the message to as many people as possible, but you're not really that concerned that the message is right, that will lead to spiritual anemia. It will lead to spiritual unhealth. It is heat without light. It's, it's passion without insight. That's mission without doctrine. But then over here on the other end of the spectrum, you have some churches and some ministries that focus so much on doctrine, they miss out on the mission. For them, the priority is not getting the message to as many people as possible. For them, the priority is making sure you get the message right. And we don't really care if we get the message out to many people. And so this is like, we want to make sure that we're doctrinally accurate. We want to make sure that we have theological clarity. We really want to make sure that our doctrine is pure. And we don't really care that much about mission. Folks, that leads, if, if the one extreme leads to spiritual anemia, this extreme leads to spiritual apathy. It is light without heat. It is insight, but no passion. It is doctrinal accuracy minus missional urgency. And I would argue that this is an equal and opposite mistake. It will lead you to having what Paul David Tripp said. He, he said, you have a big theological head, but spiritual heart disease. You become a doctrinal nerd, a theological egghead who maybe has all the answers, but you're not really cared that, caring that much about making sure that people hear the message. That is a, a, equally an error. Paul helps us navigate those two extremes. Paul helps guide us through understanding that both doctrine and mission are important. That it's important to get the message right and it's equally important to get the message to as many people as possible. Amen? Like we want people to hear, we want as many people as possible to hear the gospel. Paul says, proclaim. It's important that we have missional urgency. But it's also important that we do that with sound teaching, that we have theological accuracy, that as we're getting the message out to as many people as possible, that we're actually getting the message right. 
And it's not enough just to say, we're just going to focus on Jesus and we're not going to talk about that doctrine stuff. Well, how do you know about Jesus? What do you know about Jesus apart from doctrine and theology and scripture? And it's equally important to not just say, well, we're just going to talk about theology all the time, but we don't really care about the mission. We have to have both missional urgency and doctrinal accuracy. And you can hold those two things at the same time. Amen? Think about this, right? Um, Next month, we're having Thanksgiving. Uh, You've heard about that over the last few weeks. We're going to be feeding 200 families Thanksgiving meals. And when you think about feeding families or hunger relief, some of you have participated in Moberly's hunger relief efforts over the years. We're doing more of that next year. When When you're focused on hunger relief, you want to feed as many people as possible, right? That's the goal. We want to feed as many hungry mouths as we can. But if you focus on feeding as many people as possible, but you give them food that is poisoned, you're not being helpful, you're being harmful. You've got to focus both on the quantity of the number of people you're feeding, but also the quality of the food that you're feeding them. You need to focus not only on the fact that they are fed, but what they are fed. That is what Paul is saying here when he says proclaim, yes, but proclaim with sound teaching. Care about the mission, yes, but also care about doctrine. And let doctrine guide and guard the mission. Amen? All right, now the second thing he tells us is this. While the mission is guarded by and guided by doctrine, Paul tells us in verses two and following that the mission is grounded in discipleship. That part of the healthy mission of the church is not just that we preach the gospel and then leave, right? When we take a mission trip, we don't wanna just share the gospel, hop on a plane, you know, a bunch of people are saved and we just leave them and we get on a plane and come back to America. We wanna make sure that we are focused on discipling them as well, helping them to grow in their walk with Christ. That's part of what we focus on here at Moberly. We want to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. The way that that happens is through discipling relationships. And Paul actually addresses that in this paragraph. Did you notice in verses three and four, Paul says the older women are to teach and encourage the younger women. And then in verse six, the same is expected of older men teaching and encouraging the younger men. Paul had modeled that. Paul had invested his life in Titus. Now he expects Titus to invest his life in others and those that he invests in are to invest in others still. If doctrine is the foundation for mission, These kind of discipling relationships, you can think about being the glue for mission. This is how we carry out the mission. The mission is like a relay race. If if you've ever uh, run track in high school or maybe you watched the Olympics this summer, then you probably saw a relay race. Relay race is where one runner uh, runs a portion of the race and then passes the baton to the next runner who runs the next portion and then passes the baton to someone else who runs the next portion after that. The mission of the church is like a relay race where one runner passes the baton of faith to the next. That baton pass is what we call discipleship. It's where you take what has been entrusted to you and you entrust that to someone else. And that's really Paul's vision for the mission. Paul's vision is not that the Cretans would just receive the gospel and keep it to themselves or even that they would proclaim the gospel and then move on but that they would invest the gospel in life on life discipleship through relationship, that the church would be full of people who are connected to other Christians where they're being both poured into and pouring into others. That is discipleship. Paul says it this way in 2 Timothy chapter two and verse two, he says, what you've heard from me um, uh, in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, I want to leave that on the screen for just a moment because I want you to pay attention to the fact that there are four generations in that one verse. There is Paul. Paul takes what had been entrusted to him and he entrusts it to Timothy. And then Timothy is to entrust that to faithful men. And those faithful men are to entrust that to others. That is what discipleship looks like. You've been entrusted with something from someone. You turn around and entrust that to someone else. Think about it. Someone cared enough about you to hand you the baton. Paul says, if you're gonna carry out the mission, you've got to hand that baton off to someone else. And that's an idea that's prevalent throughout the New Testament. Guess what? It's also in the Old Testament. In fact, look at Psalm 78 
verses three and four. It says, the things that we have heard and known and that our ancestors have passed down to us, we will not hide them from their children, but will tell a future generation the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his might, and the wondrous works he has performed. That is one of the great mission passages of the Old Testament. Someone poured into you, you are to pour into others. Someone has entrusted the gospel message into your life, and you're to entrust that into others. That only happens through intentional discipleship relationships. And so I wanna ask you, do you have those kind of relationships? Is someone pouring into you or has someone poured into you? If not, I wanna encourage you to seek that out. Your church staff here at Marbley, we can help you with that. If you say, man, I, nobody really discipled me. We can help you to have someone in your life who's investing and discipling you. But then if you've been discipled, you now have a responsibility. Somebody has handed the baton to you. Who are you handing that baton to? Right, what, 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 what breathes in must breathe out or it will die. And it's true in the Christian life. You breathe in what others have invested in you, but then you breathe out by investing in others. You are poured into, and then you pour into others through intentional discipleship relationships. And notice the pattern. It's the older pouring into the younger. Older men pouring into younger men. Older women pouring into younger women. The idea is that there are those who are further along in the faith journey. There are others who've walked the road before you. They are older, they are wiser, they are more mature in faith. They're further down the journey, the path of discipleship. And they look behind them and they invest in those who are a little bit of maybe a few steps or a few miles behind them. And they pour into the people who are behind them who are coming up. This is why multi-generational church matters. It's really important to have both older and younger and that the older generation and the younger generation are in relationship with one another. Amen? Listen, young people, if you're young in the room, you may look at the old coots and codgers who are sitting around in this room and you may think that you don't need them, but you need those old coots and codgers. Amen? They're wiser, they're more mature, they're godlier, they're older, they've been down that pathway, they've learned some things, can I get a witness? They've, they got a graduate certificate from the School of Hard Knocks. You need them, you need their wisdom. You need them to pour into you. It's a really good thing that this room, although we have lots of young people and that is a great blessing, it's really important that this is not a church just full of young people. It's also important that it's not just a church full of old people, although we have a lot of old people. I'm just gonna leave that right there. <laughs> and for those of you who are old coots and codgers, can I just hear an amen if you're here? Just let me know who I'm talking to. All right, if you admit it. Listen, you might be looking around and you say, boy, there's a bunch of young whippersnappers. I don't need them. You know, they listen to that terrible music and all that kind of stuff. They wear hats backwards and stuff like that. You need them and they need you, amen? And listen, there's something really important. If you are older, more seasoned, the young people in our church need you. They need you, they need you. And let me just tell you something. I don't care how old you are, God is not done with you. God has something for you to do. And you might retire from your career, but there's no retirement from the Christian life. There's no retirement from the Christian responsibility to look to that next generation and invest in them. And there are young men and young women in this room who need your wisdom, who need your experience, who need your godliness, who need your maturity. I am who I am today because I have had godly older men who've cared enough about me to invest in my life. Sometimes to tell me what to do. Sometimes I need that. I need just somebody to look in my eyes and say, this is what you're supposed to do. Sometimes they tell me what not to do. Don't do this, Andrew. Sometimes they tell me when I'm being an idiot. If you do this, you're, you're being stupid, Andrew. I need some men in my life who love me enough to tell me that. I'm a better disciple, a better husband, a better dad, because some older followers of Jesus who were older husbands and older dads looked behind and gave me a helping hand up. 
And Paul is saying, as you focus on this mission of proclaiming what's been entrusted to you, do it by investing in those discipling relationships. All right, one third and final thing that I want to point out about this passage is we're thinking about the mission, right? The mission should be guarded and guided by doctrine. We should care about sound teaching. It is grounded in discipleship, these intergenerational discipling relationships. But how do you know that you've successfully accomplished the mission? Well, Paul gives us some insight into that, and he's going to show us the goal of mission. The goal of mission. Mission's goal is devotion. Here's how you know you've successfully carried out the mission of proclaiming the gospel to the next generation. Here's how you know. People's lives look different. That's the end result of mission, is that people's lives are transformed by Jesus. Uh, If we're carrying the mission out well, it should result in changed lives, lives that are devoted to Jesus Christ, that have been changed by Jesus to look like Jesus. This is what Paul says in the very first verse of Titus. Titus 1.1, Paul says that he's giving himself to helping people come to the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. You see what Paul is saying? He's saying if you really know the truth, that should translate into a godlier life. If you've really come to know the Lord, your life ought to look different, amen? Your life ought to be changed by Jesus. It ought to be a godly life. It ought to be a life of devotion. And here in verses two through seven, Titus chapter two, Paul is describing what a life changed by Jesus actually should look like. He addresses every individual in the church, older men, older women, younger men, younger women. That covers us all. We're all either old, coots and codgers, or we're young whippersnappers, but we're old or young, man or woman. Now, that should not be a controversial thing to say. It's just the truth. You're all old or young, a man or a woman. Paul addresses all of us. And he begins to list out in verses two through seven the kinds of characteristics that should describe our lives if we belong to Jesus. If we've been changed by the Lord, this is what our lives should look like. And so let's just dive into that one group at a time. He begins by addressing the older men in verse two. If you're an older Christian man, These things should be true of you. He just describes four things here. Number one, he says that older men are to be self-controlled. Now, he actually uses the word self-control three different times in this paragraph. He uses it in reference to older men, younger women, and younger men. But the word that he uses here for the older men is a different word than he uses for younger women and younger men. The word that he uses here uh, is often translated to be sober-minded, Older men are to be sober-minded. That means to be temperate. The the idea is that as you grow older as a Christian gentleman, that your life should be marked with increasing self-restraint, increasing temperance, increasing uh, sober-mindedness. That as you get older, as an older godly man, you should not give in to your indulging your desires more and more, but that you give in to them less and less that you have a growing self-restraint in your life because you've come to see sin for what it really is. You've come in your older years to realize that sin's cost is much higher than sin's worth. You've come to believe as an older Christian man what my pastor used to say, which is that sin will take you farther than you want to go, it will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. The older you get in faith, the more you realize the truth of that statement. So you become sober-minded. And then he says you ought to become worthy of respect. I love that. Men want respect. Paul says the older you get as a godly man, you should be getting more respect. But not because you're getting older, but because your life is becoming worthier of that respect. In other words, you're living in such Christian maturity that the people around you give you more respect because your life actually is worthy of the respect that you're receiving. That should mark an older Christian man. Number three, he says you ought to be sensible. Uh, That means uh, someone who is prudent, someone who whose mind has everything under control. It denotes uh, someone who feels the weight of life feels the gravity of life, someone who in older age is not becoming silly, but becoming serious about life, someone who is a wise man, a sensible man, level-headed, has his head on straight. 
And then he says, you should become sound. Sound in faith, love, and endurance. Now, Paul has already talked about having sound teaching. He says, in your doctrine, you should be sound. But now he says, if you're an older Christian man, your life ought to be sound. Your life ought to be healthy, fit, sturdy, reliable. You should be sound in love and faith and endurance. Notice these three descriptions. You should be sound in faith. In other words, as you get older, your age has not diminished your trust in God, but has strengthened your trust in God. Older Christian gentlemen, what a great word for us, that that as we get older in faith, that our faith would not diminish, but that it would strengthen, that we would become men of bolder faith the older that we get. I, I love some of the older Christian men throughout church history and throughout scripture, that the older they get, the bolder they get. The, the more they're willing to take risks for the gospel, the, 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 the more they're willing to exercise steps of faith and model that for people in their life. Paul says you should be sound, not just in faith, but also in love. Now, what he's saying here is that a godly older man, for you as you get older, age has not caused you to be grumpier or crabbier, or more cynical, or more bitter, but more loving. Boy, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a great reputation to have, that as you get older, your reputation is not of somebody who's becoming harder, and crabbier, and grumpier, but somebody who has a more tender heart, a more compassionate life, a more loving life. Paul says, this is what it looks like to be changed by Jesus. The older you get, the more loving you get. And then sound and endurance. Paul says, if you've been changed by Jesus, then you're growing in your ability to show resilience and faith. That, that the, the years have tempered you to, to be like steel. That, that the years have tempered you so that you can bear more and more. And the older you get and the closer to the finish line you get, you're not slowing down. You're not throwing the towel in. You're speeding up to sprint to the finish. You are running the race of faith with endurance all the way to the finish line. That as you get closer to the finish line, you're actually growing in your endurance, growing in your confidence of God, growing in your love for people, growing in your hope for God more and more. Paul says, this is the description of a godly Christian man who's been changed by Jesus. All right, how about older women? Paul was brave to say it that way. I would have said seasoned women. Paul says older women. But he gives some instruction, again, for descriptions of older Christian women. If you've been changed by Jesus, this is what your life ought to look like. In the same way, he says, verse three, the older women are to be reverent in behavior. Literally, they should be temple-like. They, they treat every part of their life as something sacred. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, one of the great older, older Christian thinkers said, the Christian must live as if all of life was a sacred assembly. They treat every part of their life as something that is sacred. Not only that, but they're not to be slanderous. Notice that in the middle of verse three, not slanderers. To be a slanderer means to be a gossip. Someone who throws shade at others. Someone who seeks to put them down. Someone who does harm with their words. You remember that Cretans in chapter one are described as being always liars. Paul says, Be careful about your tongue. If you're an older Christian woman, you should not be a slanderer. Then number three, he says, you should not be enslaved. Don't be a slave to excessive drinking. Uh, Paul says your life ought not to be under the control of wine. Don't be a slave to to be an excessive drinker. Now remember how Paul described the the Cretans in chapter one. They are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. A glutton is someone who eats and eats and eats and doesn't know when to stop, or drinks and drinks and drinks and doesn't know when to stop. And Paul says, this is how the Cretans are. This is how they live. They, they eat too much, they drink too much. If you went to the bingo hall in Crete, you'd see a bunch of women who were plastered <laughs> and gossiping. <laughs> and Paul says, if you're a Christian woman, your, your life ought to look different than those who are down at the bingo hall spilling the tea while drinking too much. Your life ought to be marked by somebody who's not enslaved to wine and not a slanderer with the tongue. Don't don't live, in other words, Paul is saying, don't live 
like your Cretan neighbor down the street whose life is marked by excess and slavery to sin, your life as a Christian woman ought to look markedly different than the Cretan women on the island. And then he says, finally, that godly Christian women, <clears throat> uh, older women in the church, are, are to be those who are spiritual. They, they are those who can be counted on to be a source of godly wisdom. Notice what he says, they are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the younger women. They are to be women who in their advice to the next generation can always be looked to, to be a source of godly wisdom. I wonder if that was true of you. If you're here today and you say, yeah, I kind of fit in that category of older Christian woman. Could the other women in our church look to your life and to your lips and always expect to find from you a source of godly wisdom? Paul says, that, that's how you ought to live if, if Jesus has changed your life. You ought to be someone who can be counted on to be a spiritual woman who gives biblical godly advice. I'm thankful for my own mother. As she's getting older, I find that she's be becoming wiser. Or maybe I'm just becoming wiser. I don't know. Like she knows a lot more than I thought she did when I was 16. Seems to work that way, right? It's like, man, she really knows what she talks about. she's talking about. When I call her, I'm blessed to have a mom who gives me godly advice, biblical counsel. Paul says that ought to mark all of your lives, uh, ladies, as you're getting older in the faith, that you should be someone that the younger generation can look to as an example and as a source of godly wisdom, that you're a spiritual woman. All right, <clears throat> the younger women. What does it look like to live as a younger woman if you've been transformed by Jesus? Well, in verse four, Paul says those older women should encourage the younger women to love their husbands and love their children, to be self-controlled, that means you're not out of control. It means not, you're not under the control of something other than Jesus. You're under control, the control of the spirit. You're pure. That means in your motives, in your words, in your actions, that you are, you're, you're marked by holiness of life. Workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. All right, there's a lot there. What is Paul saying? Well, let me just try to simplify it this way. Paul is saying to the younger women in the church, you need to focus on issues of the heart and issues of the home. Issues of the heart. He's saying, pay attention to your inner life. Focus on things like self-control, purity, and kindness. That's issues of the heart. It's your inner life. Paul says, young women, that's what it looks like for you to be a godly woman. Focus on your inner life your heart, and then focus on your closest relationships. Notice he says, if you have a husband, love your husband. If you have children, love your children. He says to be a worker at home. What does that mean? Well, this is not Paul precluding women from working outside the home. He doesn't say anything about that in this passage. And in fact, there are other passages of scripture like Proverbs 31, where uh, the Proverbs 31 woman is buying and selling goods in the marketplace. And so you even have examples of that in scripture. So Paul's not precluding working outside the home. He's just saying, uh, the home is your domain. Exercise dominion well. Exercise dominion well over that space where those who are closest to you come. Be a worker at home. And then he says, be submissive to your husband. Now that's a really bad word in our culture, isn't it? What does it mean? Well, it certainly does not mean, Paul is not saying here that women are to be doormats and husbands get to be dictators, all right? That is not what uh, God's word calls for in the home. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that women are less valuable or uh, have uh, less importance to the home or anything like that. The word is hupatasso in Greek. It, it means to hear under. It was used in, uh, of the military to describe formations on the battlefield. Paul is using a word to say God has an order and a design and a formation for the home. And we're called as God's people to lean into and not away from that order. Folks, we live in a culture right now that is leaning full tilt away from that order and that formation and that design. We say men and women can be anything, any gender, do anything, and it is leading to, to total chaos. God has a design for the home. And there's actually a, an implied word for husbands here and a word for wives. If, you, if God has given you, listen guys, if you are a husband and God has given you a wife or given you children, he has also given you a responsibility to lead your family well. And the problem is not male leadership in the home. The problem is bad male leadership in the home. 
What God calls us to is good, godly, servant leadership in the home. The kind of leadership that is worthy of being followed. That's our responsibility as men. If you're a husband or you're a dad, you're called to be the godly leader of your family. Amen? Wives have a responsibility there as well. The idea of being submissive to your husband just simply means this. It just means follow his leadership. If you have a husband who's trying to lead you and guide you in a godly way, in a servant-hearted way, you have a responsibility to follow the leadership of your husband. That's all that Paul is saying there. So that God's word won't be slandered. So that by your life, you're not saying, I love my husband, but then with your life, uh, discrediting that message. And let me just try to just say something here that I think is actually important for any woman, whether you're married or whether you're single, actually. Let me just try to show you how what Paul is saying is actually a word of freedom in our day and time. Because what Paul is saying should matter as priorities for women is that you focus on your own inner life, issues of the heart, as well as those closest relationships to you. If God has given you a husband, love your husband. If God's given you children, love your children. He's saying what really matters is that you are attentive to your inner life and to your closest relationships. And folks, that is actually freeing if you think about it. What it means is you don't have to care about impressing people who are far from you. Uh, And that's an important word in this day and time of social media where we often give time and space and energy and attention and stress and anxiety to living an online world that is impressive to lots of people who are very far from us who maybe we don't even really know that well, but they get to peek into our life. And oftentimes, I mean, think about the anxiety that is caused in young people because of social media, because of the pressure to be impressive to a world that is far away. Paul says, be free from that. Focus on your own heart, focus on your home, focus on the relationships that matter that are closest to you. You don't have to impress people who are far away. Just focus on being kind and compassionate and pure to the people who are closest to you. Does that make sense? That's actually a word of freedom. Pay attention to your life and to those who are closest to you. And that is important whether you're married or whether you're single. All right, the last group that Paul addresses here, young men. This is what he says to young men. If you've been changed by Jesus, this is how your life ought to look. This is the devoted life that you should have. He says in verse six, in the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. And make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity. Two things to young men. Be an example. What he's saying there is you ought to focus on living your life in such a way that it is imitation worthy. That others in the church, whether they are older or younger, man or woman, that if they follow you around, young man, for a week, that they would say, I want to live like that. That is a life, that is a pattern, that is an example of good works that I want to imitate with my own life. Paul says it elsewhere, don't let anyone despise your youth, but make yourself an example to the flock. So young men, that's the expectation there. If if Jesus is working in your life and changing your life, focus on living out a good example of good works. And then he says, and be self-controlled in everything. And that's really important because young men are full of passions and appetites and ambitions and desires. And ambitions and desires and appetites are not a bad thing unless they're not under control. And if they're not under control, they go from something, being something that can be very helpful and productive to being something that can be very harmful and destructive. So think about guys, young men, particularly, listen to me. Think about the difference between a bull and a seeing eye dog. Okay? Follow me. A bull. Powerful could whip anybody, right? But if you go to a rodeo and you see a bucking bull, that is power that is not restrained. It is power out of control. And that power is used to harm. It is used to destroy. It can even be deadly. And if you're a young man, God has given you the gift of power. But power is to be stewarded faithfully. It has been entrusted to you and power out of control is harmful. It destroys everything in its path. On the other hand, a seeing eye dog, dogs are also powerful. Great intelligence, great power, 
but under restraint, controlled, usable. And a seeing eye dog, rather than being harmful, is helpful. Rather than being destructive, is productive, helps people. Paul is saying, focus on being under the control of God's spirit so that your desires, which out of control could destroy everything in your path, and it can even destroy your life, under control can be used by God to make a powerful impact in the lives of others. The book of Proverbs says it this way, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32, he who rules his spirit is greater than he who takes a city. And a young man who's powerful and intelligent but under control is a beautiful thing to behold. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. John Stott says that means control of temper and tongue, of ambition and appetite. Folks, as as we close this morning, I wish I had more time. (laughs) But let me just tell you, whether you're an older man or woman or a younger man or woman, Paul here is describing the end goal of mission. We ought to see lives changed that begin to look like this, that have been changed by Jesus. But let me just tell you this. Living this kind of life is only possible through Jesus. Amen? Amen. And as you read this list of characteristics of older men and women, younger men and women, what I don't want you to hear this morning is some kind of legalistic instruction like do this so that God will love you. Let me just unburden you of that. There's nothing you can do to make God love you. So you shouldn't read a list like this and say, okay, I'm gonna try really, really hard to do these things so that God will approve of me. The good news of the gospel is that there's nothing you can do to make God love you, but God loves you still. And he loves you and accepts you not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus does for you. And because he loves you, listen, you don't obey or live this kind of life in order to get God's love. You already have God's love through Jesus. We live this kind of life in response to that love and actually it's produced by God's love. God loves us so much, he actually wants our lives to look different. He he doesn't want us to look like the people in Crete, right? And the people of the culture. He loves us so much, he's gonna transform us from the inside out. There's an old legend about a king in Crete who would, he was so cruel, he would write laws and hang them so high that no one could read them. And then he was so cruel that when people broke the laws that he had written that people couldn't even see, he would punish them by putting them to death. That's not the kind of king we have. We have a king who loves us so much, he kept the law for us in our place. And he loves us so much He doesn't put us to death. He died for us in our place. That's the king we have. And we have a kind of king who loves us so much, he actually wants to change us from the inside out so that our lives look different, that we actually live godly lives. We call that grace. And it's actually how Paul begins his letter, grace to you. It's the framework for everything else. Anything else that we do for Jesus is always driven by God's grace in us. Amen? Would you bow with me? Lord, we want to carry out the mission well. Help us with that. Help us to be attentive to sound teaching. Help us to care about doctrine. Lord, help us to be attentive to discipling relationships one generation to the next. And help us to be attentive to how you want to transform our lives from the inside out. Lord, I pray for every person in the room, whether they're an older or younger man or woman, that our lives would be marked by your grace and that it would result in godliness. 